Hello everyone, welcome to NPTEL course on Rural Water Resource Management, week three, lecture one. In the first lecture of the first week, we looked at the introduction to the course. And over the first week, we looked at how the course is going to shape and an introduction to hydrological cycle. In the second week, we identified three parameters which are very close to the rural water resource management namely precipitation, evapotranspiration, and surface runoff and discharge. In this week, week three, we will be covering another three parameters from the water cycle. As I mentioned, there are multiple parameters in the water cycle that could contribute to the rural water management. But for the time and also the length of the course, we are focusing on the dominant three. In this water cycle, you would have seen the size of the arrows bigger, which means bigger contribution of water volume. So you have the precipitation, which we covered in the first chapters. And then you had evapotranspiration, which is also a bigger arrow, which is a loss to the system. And we also looked at surface runoff, which is a bigger, heavier component. So we also looked at why these three parameters are very important for rural India, especially precipitation because it drives the agriculture in rural India. The livelihoods are based on this precipitation. And then we looked at evapotranspiration, which is the combination of evaporation and transpiration, wherein evaporation is from open surfaces. Then you have your freshwater bodies or oceans. Open and land. This barren land can also evaporate. Whereas transpiration is the water which is taken up by plants and transpired into the atmosphere. You could see the plant water uptake and then giving it back to the atmosphere as evapotranspiration. So that is where you have transpiration and evaporation together and evaporation separately would be on places where there is no plant or animal life. For example, on top of an ocean, uh, there's no living uh, plants and uh, animals that are breathing on the top, which could transpire. So everything is under the water. So uh, most of the uh, losses of water is evaporation. So that's a good point. Please do not uh, think that oceans also have life forms in terms of plants like planktons and big whales, etc. Don't they transpire? They might, but it is under the ocean waters. So all of it is combined to the water and only the evaporation is taken into account. Runoff and discharge. So we looked at a bigger component of runoff and discharge into uh, from precipitation converting into these storage units. In this week's lecture, we will be looking at surface water storage, a very important part for rural water management because precipitation occurs and I've shown you if you do not capture it, it ends up as runoff and discharge. So if you have surface water structures and storage units, you can capture these water for future use. Some of it is naturally <coughs> there in the system, whereas most of it is engineered or man-made, we call it. So those type of water structures we will look at and how natural versus engineered can help rural India, we will look at those concepts also. Another important component is soil moisture. So soil moisture is already kind of included in your evapotranspiration because water goes in and then gets relocated from soil moisture, the plant takes it up. However, there is some dynamics that happens at the soil moisture level. So we will look into detail that aspects in this week's lecture. Moving on, the most uh, important part for rural India in terms of water during non-monsoon season is taken from groundwater. A very key source for irrigation in, in uh, rural India uh, and 
especially during climate change extremes, because studies have shown that floods and droughts are at a very high frequency compared to 20 years, 30 years ago in India. However, the volume of rainfall doesn't change much. Okay, so which means your rainfall is occurring in an annual event, but it is concentrated. When you have a concentrated event, that is a flood. And also when you have a, a big dry spell, that becomes a drought. Okay, so instead of three months non-monsoon, here because the monsoon is shortened, you have a five month non-monsoon period, which contributes to the drought. The plant stresses, uh, trees uh, stress and they die. So it is very important to understand soil, moisture, and groundwater, which are components that can alleviate or reduce the impact of climate change on plants. So those are the three components that we'll be looking at in detail in this week's lecture. Apart from this, uh, there might be some interfluxes and inter storages um, Please don't understand that surface water is totally disconnected from soil moisture and soil moisture is disconnected from groundwater. Like in the previous lecture, precipitation is one unit and that converts, converts into evapotranspiration and then it converts into runoff and discharge, right? There's no mixing back and forth. But here, there is a possibility. For example, a surface water storage can lead to soil moisture which can also lead to groundwater. And on the same way, groundwater can lead up into soil moisture due to capillary rise, and your soil moisture can contribute to groundwater storage also. In other words, groundwater can also contribute to surface water storage. So all these aspects we would look at in this week. So these uh, arrow marks are kind of telling the same what I've explained right now wherein your groundwater can go into a lake and river. Okay, so groundwater can go into a surface water storage, which is your freshwater lake. However, your lake can also give back to groundwater. So there is interconnections also exist. So once you understand how these compartments are uh, and also understand what are the differences between them, then you could also understand that there could be some linkages between them. Please understand that all this water comes from precipitation uh, and precipitation we have defined it as rainfall for all throughout the lecture. Snow melt, uh, hail, sleet, rainfall, everything is there. But for rural focus, we are only looking at rainfall. Let's look at surface water storage. In short, we can call it as SWS. Why is SWS important? It is important because all rainfall cannot be caught and used at once by plants. Because the rate in which the plant takes up the water is much slower, slower than the rainfall. So if you do not catch, if a plant cannot catch the rainfall within a period, then the excess rainfall converts to runoff. And it is lost from the system. For example, let's take here in this image. If you have a rainfall, on one side you have rainfall, and no uh, tanks here, no farm ponds or tanks here, or whereas on the other side of the ridge, it's like a small hill uh, and there's a ridge. So in this side, you have tanks. If rainfall occurs on this area, what would happen? You would be seeing a, in this area, I'm saying. So what you would see here is rainfall would occur and it will convert into surface runoff and then exit out of the system. It will go into this lake and then go out. However, if you have water flowing on this, it will be captured by this surface water storage units. So that is why uh, it is very important to have surface water storages, depending on your setting, because if you have to lose land. So land is a commodity that is very precious when it comes to farming. If you have land excess or some land that you can sacrifice to capture the water, it is good. So here a farmer has given 10% or 5% of the land to capture the water so that the remaining 90% can be benefited. What are the different types and forms of surface water storage? There are many, many types. And as I said, 
there is natural versus engineered or man-made. So we'll be looking at the difference between them. We'll be also debating on what is better. And this course, if you look at, there's a lot of debates and discussions because I would like to have you think rather than saying this is the best uh, or another system is the best. I would like you to apply yourself, take the understanding, the, the physics and the properties of these water bodies, and then you apply it to your field. Then you will know which one is better for your region. Okay. So what are the different types and forms? There are multiple uh, different types. We will go into some of them in detail. Then we would also look at how do you quantify the water in the surface water storage. Because when you want to do a rural water resource management, you would eventually need to understand how much storage you have and how much are you capturing for future use. Okay, So uh, that is where we have uh, to understand which method we use for measuring the water discharge, what is the method you have for calculating the release of water, all those aspects we would cover in this lecture. What is happening to rural SWS? What are the conditions of this rural surface water storage units? We will be looking into these also in detail because surface water structures have been there from a long, long time. Uh, before the King's era, I would say, because in those times during the King's era, you did not have groundwater access. Digging a well is not as common as now because technology has uh, actually eased out the situation. You, you put a point and say, I want a well there. You can bring your door logger uh, in a truck and then within an hour, you will get your well. In those days, it was not that easy, right? So you would have to hand dig it. Uh, there's no dynamites or bombs to blast and then build a well. Everything was handmade. So it took a long time. So what people did is to rather going deep groundwater, they used to capture the rainfall into tanks and, and other systems, dams, canals, anaikat, etc. So we'd be looking at what has happened to these uh, water resource structures uh, in, in rural regions. Or it was used for irrigation. So the first type, as I discussed, let's look at some SWS types natural, uh, naturally there. First are ponds. Uh, you have these ponds in locations where there is a depression. Okay, So all land is not flat. You have uneven landscapes, right? Some land is, is depression and somewhere you have a slope. So uh, you, don't, you don't see uh, a natural land which is very flat. That can't be natural because you would dig and till it to make it flat. So you would have all these uneven disturbances or depressions in the land. So those contribute to small, small water storages. So what is a pond? As everyone knows, ponds are small units in your land that can store water and lakes could be visualized as a bigger lake. Uh, but knowing all these natural events, you can also have man-made ponds and man-made lakes. So the image that I showed previously is a man-made pond. So understanding from nature, a lot of farmers have included the same concept in a engineering aspect. So ponds and lakes are natural depressions where water would be stored. Runoff happens. And from the runoff, water gets stored in ponds and lakes. Then you have zero order streams. So stream order is something that connects or understands how a stream converts into river. Okay. So when you have rainfall, uh, some small streams are formed and the small, small streams connect to bigger streams and then come back into the bigger river. So you would have uh, known from the watershed diagrams I showed in the last class, uh, have a stream which is coming and then another stream coming and then they combine into a bigger stream. Okay, So uh, what is a zero order stream? A zero order stream is something that doesn't connect to another stream. So it just flows and then stops. By the time the water flows, it is either evaporated 
or transpired because it is taken up by plants or in other words it can also go into the ground as groundwater recharge so by the time the water converts from rainfall into a stream and flows along a river or a stream if it gets lost without connecting to another stream it is called a zero water stream so you can visualize it as a long elongated water storage because water comes in and gets stored but by the time it goes to the end it is lost so a zero water stream can be visualized as a water storage wells and depressions uh, as i said some natural things can also be uh, man made for example a depression on the sides if you make some more space a little bit of disturbance you create it could be a well some wells are naturally there if you go to a depression um, and you see some water seeping on the sides so that is becomes a well right uh, you could find these kind of wells in mountainous regions so you go there you see always a water which is being stored can be from rainfall yes but it can also be from groundwater giving in so whenever there is a groundwater influence it is called a well if it is only a surface water influence you call it as a pond pond or a lake there are different names across india so india is a very beautiful country where um, every single state has its own language different cuisine food spice level and different way of clothing uh, so the same way you would see that beautifully they have kept different names for their water structures and also there are different methods traditionally how they used to harvest the water i'm going to give an example from tamil nadu uh, where you could see that the well, let's go from the bottom to up the size wise so in, in my uh, explanation here i did not go fully by size because ponds lakes wells depression there is no size order but in this diagram beautifully they have shown so let's go by size okay? so in a watershed when rainfall occurs the first things to form are small small pools of water we call it them pool like just you can five people can stand in that water it's called a pool tank okay or in other words a depression uh, a, a smaller uh, depression can lead to a bigger depression so you could see how this water is leading to this so from the bottom up the size is increasing okay so a small depression can become a larger larger depression and eventually it can become a pond so a kulam is a pond okay so we have a pond here then what happens is these ponds and lakes can actually give water to a small stream right so for example you have a pond the stream can uh, come into and deposit water in the pond also when the pond overflows it can give water to a stream so that is where we see that once you have these small depressions filling up with water and they can no longer fill up more water it can go into a bigger prospect okay so bigger prospects would be a basin where water is caught a uh, catchment where water is caught, caught and kept what is a basin like you have in your uh, sink basin uh, or a kitchen sink basin we call it is a big storage for water where water is stored okay so you can also have uh, a big pond or lake can be called as a water basin so these would then eventually give up water to a slightly bigger stream called a medium stream Okay, so streams are of different levels. You have a small stream coming from small depressions, and then the depressions can give way to a basin, uh, and then you can have canals uh, where natural canals are there, similar to uh, a stream network. You have natural flow paths where water is taken from the medium stream into a larger stream. So Erie is a bigger stream. And now that the small stream has become a medium stream and then a larger stream so once it becomes a larger stream it gets into a big river okay so this is how you have different water storage types and once the water storage types have filled up they get connected to a different water network so 
So here, what are the uh, water storages? We do have depressions. We have small basins, ponds, uh, and we also had lakes. So all of them in, in uh, connection uh, or when it's connected through a channel, a channel or a stream, it goes into the bigger streams. Okay, so at the end of the day, you get into the rivers, which is your discharge. So it is beautiful that precipitation converts to these storages and once the storage fills up, then it passes on to the bigger river. As I said, uh, India is very beautiful in terms of the diversity we have. And uh, it is a very unique country in the world where different um, origins of language, uh, food, culture is there. So that is being reflected in the water also. So water is very connected to people. You would see that without water, uh, the, it is actually connected to their food, their lifestyles, their, uh, how they spend their time, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So here, let's look at some of the water storage structures across India. Uh, let's start from north and go down to the south. In the north, you have in Jammu and Kashmir, Kul, where uh, these are fed by snow melt. You can see the snow melt background here. And you have snow laden Himalayas. And when there is big snow melt because of the radiation and sun's heat, they come down and form big ponds uh, or lakes. So these are called Kuls. Then on to the uh, west, you do have uh, Zabos in Nagla, Nagaland, where Zabos are along the trenches. So they have trench farming. Uh, and uh, along the trenches, they, you do have some water storage. So they are doing terrace farming. So they cut on, on different uh, levels. And on the terraces, some places, they do have water. Instead of uh, having <coughs> um, irrigation, or putting crops, they can dig it deep so that water, when it comes, can be stored. This one is a beautiful structure because on the all the water that are becoming runoff from the river or also from your uh, roads can be stored here. So Bihar, you have Ahar pines, which are also similar in nature. You could see uh, between the field and uh, the road, you do have some structures where water is being stored. <laughs> Uh, in Johats, uh, in Rajasthan, it is more like a check dam where a larger man-made lake is being created by creating embankments on the side and then they, they actually uh, block the water from flowing and storing the water there. You do have a similar kind of networks in uh, Virdas, uh, Gujarat. So Virdas is also a kind of a check dam on these locations. Then when you come to uh, Meghalaya, you have uh, bamboo drip irrigation where the stored water is being sent to or uh, distributed across the field using bamboo irrigation. Then you have Surangams in Kerala and Karnataka. So the name is being shared similar because of the origins of the language. Uh, and what does Surangam means? It is like a tunnel. Okay, so they have created tunnels where water can go in and be taken from one place to other or even stored there uh, because tunnels are in mountainous regions. You won't lose that much water. And coming back to Tamil Nadu, uh, we saw here also how it is, but uh, in this image to the size, we have Eri. Eri is like a pond, a big pond or a lake, which is having embarkments on the side, man made, which is basically dug up mud or, or uh, some stones that are kept on the side. And then the water is just kept within the boundary. So there are major uh, surface water storage structures in rural settings. Uh, what are the major types? They are all traditional in nature, the natural ones I'm saying. Uh, they're dependent on the rainfall, soil type, slope and availability of materials. Please understand that depending on the rainfall, these structures would work. You cannot put a cool system in Gujarat because the water is too much uh, in the Jammu and Kashmir regions, whereas it is very small in Rajasthan and Gujarat. These are semi-arid or arid regions. So the 
type of the structure changes because of the rainfall type and soil type because some soils can hold the water whereas some soils cannot. So you cannot expect the same structure to be used across India. Also the slope plays a vital role. You could see the slope in Nagaland being straightened out and then storing the water where that practice cannot work in Gujarat. And availability of local materials like the bamboo irrigation uh, or wood uh, which is kept on the sides of ahar pines to, to stop the water from flowing on that sides, etc. etc. The local materials also include the rocks here, for example, uh, the sorangam is made by a town, so you need <coughs> a big rock. An area on the sides, they will keep the rock material. So all of this depends on the local materials. So what we have come across is uh, all these uh, natural types are mostly traditional knowledge, a lot of trial and errors. Uh, the people have tried and uh, they have settled in uh, a particular type and these have been there for generations, hundreds of years, right? So it has still working in many regions. For example, the Anaikat in Tamil Nadu, Trichirapalli district is the oldest in the world, oldest in the world of uh, a water structure that is still operating. Um, and some people call it as a dam which actually channelizes the water for irrigation. So those who would like to check it out, you could check out the history of the Kalanei Dam. Uh, it's called a dam and an anaikat both because it does store water, but an anaikat actually changes the course of the water direction. So that is both is being achieved in this uh, unique project. It is uh, It was done by the Cholas and it's still working very well. So. Let's move on to the engineering types. These are more newer technologies uh, with concrete and other materials that have been used widely. Uh, the first engineering type is large dams where a large piece of land is taken and evacuated, which means dug using JCPs and other heavy uh, machinery. Um, and then on the banks, they put cement structures or embankments using mud. And the most important, the outlet is blocked. The outlet is blocked using a, a big wall kind of a structure. So those are large dams and everyone knows how a dam looks like. Uh, and then you have different sizes of dams. You have a large dam, which is used for hydropower and also uh, irrigation water supply. And then you have small dams or check dams, which are much, much smaller in size and budgets. Okay, and then you have overhead tanks where water can be stored in uh, a tank uh, on top of the houses uh, or also you have tanks under underground like petrol uh, tanks. So all these tanks can also work um, and they can store water. So here what I've shown you is how water can be stored in different volumes uh, and as the volume increases the name of the structure also changes from dams to tanks. So to conserve this water, it is very important to monitor how much water we have and how it's done. You need to have a record of the level, water level in the tank. So imagine it's a pan and inside the pan you have water. Rainfall, stream discharge, runoff, et cetera, et cetera. So now to conserve the water or know how much we use, we need to periodically measure the level of the water, right? That done by actually putting a stage. So you see, see a, this measurement device or a painting on the wall is called a stage where <coughs> it has markings for different units. Um, and uh, basically you collect the data every day on how the level changes. So if you know the level is changing and if you know the size of your water structure, you can calculate how much volume is lost. Same way, if you know water is coming in and the level is rising, then you know how much water volume is coming into the system. So both the water coming in and the water release can be monitored by this simple measurement of the level. Okay, so the monitor, monitoring does need to know how much incoming water is coming off uh, from discharge and stream network. Same way, you, you also have to need to understand how much is released for irrigation or pumps are put taken for lift irrigation. 
So how much water is consumed is also very important to document. And it is also important to estimate losses. For example, it is a stored water. So there's always evaporation. Please remember the evaporation we discussed. What did we discuss? It is from open surface. So this water storage unit can release water into the atmosphere through evaporation. So all this can be monitored if we periodically monitor the level of your water storage structure. And that is very, very difficult uh, in nowadays because it is very expensive have a meter there and there are other issues on putting a meter we'll cover that in the separate but right now uh, we do not have good data for smaller structures large dams yes we do have good data so every day we know how much water is coming in someone puts a meter in the entry point to the dam and also they know how much water is released because they put uh, similar to the entry point they put an exit point uh, measuring device on the dam and they have an evaporation rate for that particular location. So both incoming is monitored, evaporation loss is monitored and your release is monitored. But also there is groundwater discharge and the recharge. So there, so there are some things which uh, have to be assumed because uh, it is very difficult to measure groundwater coming in and going out. Uh, because then we don't know how much evaporation is happening, how much groundwater. So somewhere it is being clubbed with evapotranspiration, the losses. So we just look at as a loss, we look at as entry as a positive to the system, the negative part is the loss due to evaporation and the water released is a negative to the system. So at the end of the day, we have a structure like this. Uh, this is the work we did for uh, Rajasthan and Gujarat under the Marvi project. Uh, where we basically said uh, to the farmers, please monitor this. And they didn't know how to monitor. They didn't have a scale. So we just painted it. We just uh, made a wall along the river uh, and along the dams. And then we just put these structure things and said, okay, just now monitor it. Have a book uh, and then take the readings every day to know that at least, at least how much water was there compared to previous and today. So if we know how much water is there previous day and today, uh, then we can know how much water is actually getting stored or lo losing from the system. And if we know how much water is stored, we can plan for irrigation. We can plan on a crop to irrigate the water. So all this is being covered by just a simple monitoring device or a monitoring exercise. So it is very important to monitor. And this is how uh, one of the simplest methods to monitor surface water storage. With this, uh, I'm concluding the water storage lecture. Let's meet in the next lecture on the other topics that we're going to discuss for the hydrological cycle.